Good afternoon from beautiful Honolulu. This is Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii, program code green. I have the honor of having as my guest today, Executive Vice President of the Grassroots Institute, Mr. Joe Kent. Welcome, Joe. And what we're going to be talking about is the economics of dealing with uh, climate change. And let me set the stage by saying that I'm in the field of energy efficiency and doing whatever we can to ameliorate the effects of uh, climate change. My attitude and the attitude of my colleagues is that while we have many, many problems in this world, Russia, Ukraine, so forth, the, the 800 pound gorilla overshadowing everything is climate change. It is the tsunami that is going to wash over us pretty darn soon. We don't know if it's one year, five years, but it's going to come on like gangbusters. In fact, it already is coming on like gangbusters. And when I think of the economics of that, I make the analogy of a of parents who discover that their young child has a very rare disease and it's life-threatening and insurance is gonna cover most of the costs, not all of it. And over the next few years, they are gonna to have to pay out from their pockets $100,000 to keep this child alive. Do they think cost benefit? No, they just do it. And that's a pretty extreme analogy for what I and many others think of when we need to deal with climate change. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I actually, the, I, I think it's a great analogy, $100,000, mm -hmm. because, um, you know, I was looking at the costs of Hawaii's debts and unfunded liabilities and capital expenditures, deferred maintenance, uh, energy, you know, renewable energy costs. And, and if you rack up all of those costs, it's over $100,000 per person. And so, you know, it's over $100 billion. Um, and so that is a huge cost. And a lot of those um, initiatives people feel passionately about each of them, you know, um, that we need to pay our debts, you know, obviously we need to fund the public retirement systems. We need to make sure our bridges don't fall. Um, and on top of that, there's these energy goals. And so, um, so I think that's actually your uh, analogy is perfect. Mm-hmm. And let, let me give you a, a real soft opening on this here. My own personal finances improved drastically when an economist friend of mine said, Howard, pay off all your credit cards, settle all your debts, except your mortgage. And I took his advice, I did it, and boom, instead of paying, having to pay $200 here, $300 there for different credit card debts and other kinds of debts. Boom. That money just kept sitting in my bank and getting larger and larger and larger because I was controlling my expenses. Is, is that a good analogy to lead you off with, Joe? <laughs> yeah, I think it's always good when we can try to think about our home budget in the same way that we think about Hawaii state budget because um, you know the state has a quote unquote credit card, so to speak. It can put debt on that card and it can you know pay the interest payments and the debt service just like we pay a credit card bill. Um, and so yeah, it's always a good thing to think about you know how does a family budget look like and it, what does the state do? If the state were a family, would its finances actually be in order? And so, of course, you know, I work at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, which takes a hard look at the numbers. And we're very concerned about the financial sustainability of the state. Uh, we see a lot of people who have trouble just paying for their own home bills, let alone paying for the state's bills. 
and having such trouble that they're leaving the state, which they've been doing now on net since 2016. You know, tens of thousands of people have left every year because of the cost of living. Mm -hmm. And so my interest in the climate change and renewable energy question is, what is the cost? You know, what is it actually going to cost the average working family in Hawaii or single person um, in a state that already has the most expensive energy bills in the nation? Um, you know, so I'm just trying to map out the costs. And it turns out it's kind of hard to find those costs because <laughs> there's a lot of complexities to it. Mm -hmm. Well, let me uh, throw into this the uh, concept of payback time. Whereas a lot of uh, government costs say repairing a bridge, we do not want bridges falling down. We had that in Philadelphia. I don't think we want to uh, repeat Philadelphia's experience. But how do you measure the payback time of that? Well, you don't have accidents, that, but that's way in the future. But in terms of energy efficiency, my own uh, field, if you spend a couple of extra dollars, say just for instance, on more efficient lights in your home or in government or street lights, you're going to be way, way upping your efficiency and say you pay two extra dollars for the lamp, but you're getting twice the efficiency, the payback time, those two extra dollars are gonna be paid back within months not years. Oh, yes. So that, yeah. That's one way we, 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 we look at it, efficiency. How quick yeah. is the payback time? That's a great lens. You know, I, I always love it when renewable energies or um, clean energies cost less because what we see when that happens is the market forces naturally gravitate towards adopting those technologies. Mm -hmm. So your example is perfect. You know, um, you know my wife, looks for the light bulbs that will cost us less money. And in so doing, we're actually being more sustainable that way. And so, um, you know, in the same way, we want the economy to drive towards those uh, energy technologies that are more efficient and more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And then I hear counters to that. Will solar energy is so expensive and so forth, so forth, and it's going to have a a twenty year payback. And incidentally, I, in doing my calculations and recommending things, I put a five year payback as the absolute max. And generally, I'm getting under three years uh, payback, and in many cases, zero time payback. You just adopt a different technology. But some people claim. Oh, solar energy is going to have a 30-year payback. And there, there's mm -hmm. this huge disparity in, in how you uh, ca calculate. And I also might say that when it comes to efficiency, more efficient light bulbs and so forth, or solar energy, you don't have the continuous maintenance cost that you do with other forms of energy, like we're burning fossil fuels. Every day we are importing more and more oil that's going into power plants and power plants don't run themselves. You have to have a lot of highly skilled people running them and then you have to shut them down periodically to mm -hmm. maintain them. So there, there's another uh, uh, argument for efficiency and uh, clean energy. They, they're the gift that keeps on giving. You put them in and they last generally for at least 10 years, if not 15, if not uh, 20 years. Well, I think that's an important perspective. I I'm tr um, always want to uh, look at an issue from a, a bunch of different angles, you know, turn it upside down, look inside it. And when it comes to the cost of switching to 100% renewable energy, that's one where I always want to maintain my uh, critical eye because, you know, Hawaiian Electric Companies has just released their integrated grid plan. Mm -hmm. And that is basically shows the cost to interconnect all of these renewable energies together. Um, the plan is like 
a thousand pages though it's really mm -hmm. difficult to read through all of that um I had to uh, put down my novel reading and pick this up <laughs> you know instead and and it at the end of the plan it shows that just the cost of interconnecting all of these renewable systems would be around nine billion dollars and so that doesn't actually include the cost to actually build the renewable energy you know plants and systems themselves solar wind and so on so far that cost as far as i know hasn't been calculated you know the cost to create all of that uh, and that's partly because they're not exactly sure which types of energy they want to produce and how much it will cost in the future and so on so there's a lot of assumptions going into these projections but already we're seeing really you know eye popping numbers now hawaiian electric says that their renewable um, plan will actually save people more money in the long run you know if if um, oil prices go up and renewable prices stay low as they are now um, you know some renewable energy is low then in the future it will save money for uh, ratepayers but that's a big if in my mind because what if oil prices what if the opposite happens oil prices go down and uh you know prices for renewable energies skyrocket um then we might see um us losing out on that deal from a financial standpoint so i'm just um you know kind of looking at the assumptions behind the oil spikes and we've had a lot of you know, economists throughout the decades and stock pickers trying to pick the price of oil it turns out it's not that easy to predict to predict the price of oil every time there's widespread agreement that oil is going to go up it goes down you know adjusted for inflation and so um so i'm just wondering how much this will cost and whether our assumptions are really um if we're using all the best assumptions in order to calculate this well if you could accurately predict the price of oil for say for a year from now and you invested accordingly you and you were accurate you would be a very rich man yeah that's because, true <laughs> uh, the price of oil is so volatile question what is happening in Russia which used to be a major 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 oil supplier what's happening with the other oil suppliers uh Saudi Arabia turns out to be a very very iffy uh entity right now and they are the world's major oil supplier so that's it's right really, if you really volatile but that said I want to point out to the county of Kauai where they have led <clears throat> the rest of the state and actually the rest of the nation in installing renewable energy and their cost is actually going down they are now below the rest of the state and I won't go into the economics of uh, electricity pricing right now but due to their extensive uh, renewable energy use and I might say that they also specify efficiency a whole lot they are really and truly going down and they are in terms of stability resilience they are less dependent than the rest of us counties on on yeah. oil so in the event that everything shuts down they, they've got uh, they've got to keep they can keep the lights on much more easily than the rest of us can yeah that's true um the I, th I think there must be some kind of a principle in renewable energy that points to the fewer people that you're powering with renewables the more savings uh, you can realize quicker and so you know for example if I put solar panels on my home I might see savings you know this year or next year already but if you have a large county like with a million people like Oahu and a comparatively small amount of land on that island it's much more difficult to find the cost savings that we see on Kauai you know Kauai even has I think um a much better uh battery solution with 
there, um, I, I guess they have a lake that um, powers a windmill, and uh, that helps with the sort of storage, uh, energy storage situation. But on Oahu, um, that's a, a bit more difficult. And, you know, Big Island and Maui, Big Island, of course, has geothermal, um, which contributes greatly to their renewable mix. And uh, mm-hmm. you, I think you could actually do geothermal on Maui, too, but not on Oahu, or at least it'd be very difficult. So, um, so but you're right, though, that uh, Kauai is a leader in this space. Mm-hmm. And I, I might point out that Oahu and Kauai are approximately the same size. We, as you point out, have a million people. Kauai has only 75,000 people, or 7.5% of our population. So there's a lot of wide open spaces there. But you're yeah, that's a good on. point. And, you know, on, on Oahu, I've noticed that it seems renewable projects are falling, some renewable projects are falling uh, into disfavor from environmentalists themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, not all environmental, they're not a big blob. You know, environmentalists have many different views on many different things. Uh, the, and when it comes to, I think, the Kahuku wind farm, for example, a few years mm-hmm. ago, that was a really surprising example of protesters at renew environmental protesters at renewable energy. Mm-hmm. And so, um, of course, they, I think, didn't want it in their community. And the same is true when it comes to solar, um, which uses lots of land. Um, and um, you know, uh, windmills in the ocean, for example, um, there's a lot of environmental questions about those things as well. So um, now in, like I said, if you're in, if you have a lot of land and a very small amount of people, it may be easier to get around those things. But uh, when you're land constrained, it's much more difficult. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. And here on Oahu, we are definitely land land constrained. There have been proposals to put a solar farm here or there, and other people say, wait a minute, that's farmland. That will grow food. We have this great big push to try to get closer and closer to food self-sufficiently, and you can't cover solar panels. Actually, you can. There's a proposal to raise the solar panels up at least eight feet, if not 10 feet, and then under that, you plant shade-loving uh, uh, food like say say lettuce something something like oh, that that's in, i didn't know about that that's interesting yeah. but of course yeah. you would be the first to point out that the cost of putting solar farms or solar panels just slightly above the ground versus uh, 10 feet up that's going to raise your cost uh quite a bit yeah. there yeah and you know i think in hawaiian electrics integrated grid plan that i talked about they actually have a land constrained scenario where they don't build any offshore wind mill farms and um and most of the solar is exported to, to rooftops instead of using lots of land for that and so um you know that it's interesting that they're actually including that into their main scenarios for you know future planning because um it says that you know, even if we can't even uh, build housing in Hawaii, how are we going to build solar farms, you know, because um, they're both competing for the same land. And as you point out, even agriculture is competing for that land, too. Um, right. And of course, open space activists are op- competing for that land, too. So um, land is at a premium. And and if it takes land to produce renewable renewable energy, then renewable energy will be at a premium too, uh, unless there's some solution I'm not seeing, <laughs> which I'm totally open to. Well, I, I keep coming back to efficiency, but uh, just to stick with the solar panel uh, analogy, uh, a lot of, especially neighbor island resorts, have big parking lots for their guests. And their these guest cars are sitting in the sun, put solar panels above that, boom you have increased the value of that uh, parking structure. So there, there's a payback time in addition to- uh, Yeah, that's true. Free, quote unquote, electricity. That's true. I know my wife and I have been uh, 
looking at trying to buy a, a new apartment, you know, and and of course we look at the uh, parking lots that have solar panels are always more attractive. You know, it's just like mm -hmm. shady and, and uh, we just like the shade yeah, actually. Sure, sure. Good, good, and good so yeah. that's nice. But of course there's a capital cost to that and mm -hmm. the HOA has to pay for that and hopefully it gets paid back and everything. Most of the problems I think with renewable have to do with the capital investment. You know, if we just had billions of dollars to to invest now, um, then we'd see those billions paid back at some later date. But the problem is uh, we don't have those billions and and paying it back has to take into account the debt service costs, you know, and rising interest rates right now are are very high. And so um, trying to push off that into debt service just raises the cost even more. Which then brings in the possibility of incentives, but you would be the first to point out that generally those incentives come from either local or state or federal uh, gov government, which adds to the, the governmental cost. That's true. You know, I, I, um, I started my journey looking at renewable energies, very interested in trying to figure out how we can find more renewable energies to replace, you know, coal and oil. And I actually did a tour of renewable energy plants across the U.S. and looked at, uh, you know, wind farms and solar farms and ethanol and methane and mm -hmm. at every single um, farm or power station, there would be someone who said that they can't actually profit and make this sustainable without huge government subsidies. And so um, it seemed to me that at least when I did that, which was you know uh, more than a decade ago, uh, the subsidies were required, which then just exports the costs perhaps to taxpayers. And mm -hmm. so you know if we're trying to save money, it doesn't make sense to um, save money on one hand and then and then lose money on the other. Mm -hmm. I think maybe the exception and uh, it's come up in the last 10 years is the huge swath of great wind regime that goes from Texas all, all the way up to Canada and hopefully includes Mexico and hopefully includes uh, Canada as well, where especially where land that is not constrained, i.e. West Texas, just a few uh, cattle roaming around there. It's hugely cost effective, even though you have to have these long, long, long extension cords, so to speak, from the desert in, into the, the cities of, uh, of Texas. But yeah, that's true. I mean, if, where the wind, where the, most of the wind is in America is not where most of the people live, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately for the wind power. It takes a lot of investment in infrastructure to get that power to the places where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. And then we're going back to the capital costs again. But of course, Hawaii uh, wouldn't be able to plug into that power. You know, we, we're currently the most reliant state on oil uh, of, of any state in the nation. Mm -hmm. And so, and we're not able, like other states are, to import renewable energy from other states. And so you can't just flip a switch and get uh, power from New Mexico or something like that. And so we really, you know, if we're going to do it, have to do it all on our own. And uh, I'm just wondering what those costs will be. Yeah, well, the, we, you're talking about interconnectedness of uh, different states. The Probably the best example is the fact that the Northwest is very, very rich in hydropower. And California has something like 40 million people. That's a lot of electricity. So you have these huge lines exporting electrical energy from the Northwest to California. But as you pointed out, we just cannot uh, do, do that. Well, you know, maybe if uh, technology changes in the future, it could help some. But, um, but you know, right, right now I'm kind of concerned about the trend uh, around the world towards renewable energy simply because that means we, we've never had a time in history where so many um, people around the world 
want to um, make use and invest in renewable energy such that you know the mining that's required for renewable energy is going to be immense. I mean, we're seeing even um, electric car companies um, setting up their own mining shops in other countries around the world just so that they can get the stores of lithium that mm -hmm. that they need for their batteries. You know, not to mention the lithium that's needed just for energy storage. You know, like for the grid. And so there's a huge. You know, this it used to be a really abundant, uh, low cost thing, lithium. Mm -hmm. But now with the development of an investment and need for demand for uh, uh, batteries, battery power, um, that is going to see prices, I think, spike. They may go down in the future. I mean, the one thing about prices going up is then more people try to look for new sources of it. Mm -hmm. So um, that sometimes can see prices fall in the future. But, um, but anyways, at the moment, we're seeing a gold rush, a lithium rush. Yeah, a lithium rush. Yeah, especially <laughs> in this country, I've I've seen an example of Indonesia, and they are really despoiling the environment there by creating huge, huge, huge lithium mines. One, That's right. One, I, yeah, and one, and I uh, I am uh, sometimes concerned about the whether or not the solution is actually better than the problem. You know, mm -hmm. if we're um, now. Um, creating all these lithium mines and not just lithium, many other rare earth metals um, and trying to dig those up. What does that actually mean if we're also, um, you know, continuing to dig up all, everything else we've dug up in the past too. So this just means more mining perhaps, but um, at the same time, if you have all of these countries switching away from oil, it begs the question again, what the price of oil will do. Um, Hawaiian Electric is assuming that the price of oil will triple in the future, and which is why they say that the base, the, the status quo uh, um, energy bill will triple um, compared to switching to renewables. But it would if, put it from about eighty dollars a barrel to two hundred and forty dollars. Yes, a barrel. That's, that's right. Really effective. Yeah, that's well, right, Joe. Uh, we could continue this oh, conversation right. yeah. for a long, long, long time, but we are both getting the hook. So thank you very much, Joe Kent, Grassroots Institute, and Howard Wig, Code Green. See you in two weeks. On farewell. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.